According to a legend, in 333 BC, Alexander the Great made his way to a town called Gordian in what is now modern day Turkey. And in that town, there was a legend centered around previous King Gordius who had tied a knot that apparently no one could untie. And the legend was, if someone could ever untie Gordian's knot, they were destined to be the ruler of all of Asia. And so Alexander was just arrogant enough to try to untie this untieable knot. And so he spent an, an inordinate amount of time trying to untie this knot and finally, out of desperation, took out his sword and cut the knot in half. And to this day, Gordian's knot has become synonymous with something that is intractable, something that is difficult. It's a conundrum. It's a can of worms. It's a hornet's nest. If in philosophy, you would call it an epistemic paradox. Mathematics, you would call it an unknotting problem. Or if you like Star Trek, it's the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> it is that problem that seems unsolvable, and in theology, it is the problem of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. In our text this morning in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to see in back-to-back -back verses, Paul addressing the question centered around the phrase, work out your own salvation. So take your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to begin reading with me in verse 12, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now also in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or arguments, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding firmly the word of life, so that on the day of Christ I can take pride because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain, but even if I am being poured out, as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Now this passage is at the center of what has been a theological conundrum from the beginning days of Christianity. It was even posed this past summer on the floor of the Southern Baptist Convention when someone came to the microphone and asked how we reconcile Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13. Generally centered around the question, what is the relationship between works and salvation? Is salvation all of grace through Jesus Christ, or is there something that we do as a part of the process of salvation? It is the question of divine sovereignty, what God does, and human responsibility, what we do in the nature of salvation. And here in back-to-back -back verses, Paul frames the question, verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you. So, Paul, which is it? Am I working out my own salvation, or is it, in fact, God who is at work in me? And Paul's answer to that question is yes. There is a responsibility. You are working out your own salvation, and there is a sense in which God himself is working in you. So what I want to do this morning is, first of all, look at what this passage does not mean, and then examine what the passage means. Sadly, there are many today who have a misunderstanding of the nature of salvation, the question of salvation and works, so that they have something of a works-based kind of approach to theology, somehow thinking, if I do enough good works, 
if my good things in my life outweigh the bad things in my life. Surely God will skew things in my favor. Surely God will give me his grace on the basis of my works. That was, in fact, the question that the rich young ruler had when he came to Jesus. What do I need to do to be saved? implying that there is, in fact, something that I can do in order to be saved. And if I do enough of those good things, surely it will result, it will end in my salvation. But I would remind you this morning that the Bible teaches salvation is all of God. We are saved by grace through faith, Paul says, that's not of yourself. It's not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved only by grace through faith, so that regardless of any good works that you and I might do, those are not done in such a way as to result or, a, or gain our salvation. They are done rather on the basis of our salvation. I read an article just recently about Mother Teresa, died September 5th, 1997, this article was advocating she was one of the best people who ever lived and indeed talking about her works in Calcutta and the work at the orphanage and how not long after her death she was she was declared a saint by the Catholic Church and to be sure she was a good person but I suggest to you on the authority of God's Word this morning if Mother Teresa is in heaven today she is not in heaven on the basis of her good works because the Bible teaches there is only one way to receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, and that is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Trying harder to earn your salvation is not the Christian message. The Bible teaches that we come to Christ by faith, and he begins to mold us into a new creation in Christ. Salvation is a gift we receive, not a reward that we earn. There's nothing that you and I can do to pay for our salvation. The Bible teaches us that Jesus paid it all. That was the question that the disciples had when Jesus talked about the complexity of salvation, and they responded in despair. Then who can be saved? Jesus said, well, with man, that's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. In Philippians chapter 2, as Paul is describing the relationship of works on the basis of our salvation, I want to remind you of a couple of things going on here in Philippians chapter 2. First, I want you to note, Paul is writing to those who have already been saved. He is not writing in order for them to be saved, but he's talking to those who have been saved. In the context in verse 12, there's a transition. Therefore, looking back on everything that Paul has just said in the previous verses. Well, in the passage right before that, Paul's talking about the obedience of Christ. Look back in chapter 2, verse 8. Christ being found in the appearance of man, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And he talks about how Christ emptied himself and then ultimately how Christ will one day be exalted now sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father and one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now based on his obedience, Paul says, work out your salvation. In the same way that Christ was obedient unto death, Paul says, I want you to work out. It's not a work necessary for salvation. Christ already did that. It's a work expected because of our salvation. The passage is not talking about works for salvation. It is talking about the works that we do on the basis of having been saved. In fact, Paul's already made a similar point back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, when Paul says, I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So now, Paul, making a similar point, you work out your own salvation. So the word that Paul is using in verse 12 is a different word for work than the word used in verse 13. Look at verse chapter 2, verse 12. Just as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out 
your own salvation. And then he says, it's God who is at work in you. In our English, those are the same word. In the Greek, they're different words. The word used in verse 12 really means to bring to completion. Bring to completion the work that God already began in you. You work to continue what God began in you. But then verse 13, that word translated work means God's giving you the ability, the power, the resources. It's God who is giving you the ability to complete the work that God began in you. So the passage is really talking about two agents of work the work done by you, and a work that is being done in you. Paul's talking about working out our salvation. So what does it mean to work out our salvation? I want to suggest to you several things that the Bible is saying about what it means to work out our own salvation. Paul says, first of all, we work out our salvation based on the example of Christ. So verse 12, the transition So then, my beloved, in the same way as Christ, in the same way that Christ himself was obedient, in the same way that Christ humbled himself, he emptied himself, he took on the form of a servant, in the same way, Paul says, now you work out your salvation following the example of Christ, the obvious connection between his obedience and the obedience expected of us in light of, of his example. Our motivation is because he worked. Our motivation is his obedience because he sacrificed his one day glorification on the basis of his work. We serve, work out your own salvation. So we serve following the example of Christ. The hymn writer said it this way, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, Rising, he justified freely forever, and one day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. We work out our salvation following the example of Christ. He's our motivation for faith and works. He is the reason we work out what God has already worked in us. It means we follow the example of Christ, but I want to suggest to you, secondly, working out our salvation means bringing to completion the work God already began. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. So verse 13 is really the assumption of the expectation in verse 12. Work out your salvation. Why? Because it's God who is at work in you. So God has already begun a work. God has already started a work. So now you work out what God has already worked in. You then continue the process. Carry on to completion the work that God began in you. Some of you like to exercise. And we call that working out. Now, when I exercise, I'm not exercising to make myself taller, and I'm not exercising to make myself younger. Those are things that God alone establishes. I'm exercising, I'm working out to take care of what God has already given me. Now, in the same way spiritually, you and I are called to work out the salvation that God already gave us. So Paul is saying you continue to completion the work that God has already given you the ability to complete. God is already working in you. Paul's talking to people who've already been saved, but notice what Paul is saying. He's not saying God worked a work in you. God is working a work in you. So the process is not done. God's still working in your life. God's still, God's still moving. God's still creating in us the work that God wants us to then now complete. So working out your salvation is bringing to completion the work that God already began. Note, thirdly, working out our salvation means we work out in fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear 
and trembling. That word can mean respect, it can mean awe, it can mean reverence, but notice what the context is. Right before this verse 12 is the passage that says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So our fear and trembling is in respect of who he is, knowing that there'll come a day when I'll bow down before him, knowing that there will come a day when I all of my sins will be exposed. I work out my salvation in fear and trembling, knowing that there's a day of accountability coming. There's a day when I stand before the throne of God, and so Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. We work out our salvation based on the example of Christ continuing the work that God began in fear and trembling, but then notice we work out our salvation according to the work He began. So it's not a work that I begin. It is a work that God himself has begun, and you and I continue. Don't confuse what God does with what we do. God is at work in you, Paul says. That process of sanctification, that process of making us more like Christ, that process of drawing us more into the presence of the Father, it is God who is at work in you. Notice to will and to do for his good pleasure. God's working a work in you so that your will and your work brings him pleasure. So that what I do and what I desire to see accomplished in my life is such that brings honor and glory and pleasure to him. So that what I do pleases the Father. God is at work in you to will and to do. If you are a believer In Jesus Christ today, God not only has worked in you, God is working in you. He's not working to force your compliance. He is not manipulating your will. He is calling you to obedience. Our faith trusts God for what our works cannot produce, but our works validate what our faith professes. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. And Paul says, keep working it out. It's what Eugene Peterson describes, a long obedience in the same direction. I trust God to do his part, and I please God by doing mine. I trust that God began a work in me, and then the work that I do to bring that to completion is such that gives God good pleasure. God is working. The work's not complete. God's not yet called you home. There's still more to the process. But there'll come a day when that work that God began in you will come to a point of completion for his good pleasure. And so I trust God to do his part, and then I please God by doing mine. That's what it means to work out your salvation. So how do we do that? We continue the process that God began in us. So what does that mean for us to work out our salvation? So I want to suggest to you several things that Paul is describing about working out our own salvation. And I would note just parenthetically, Paul says, work out your own salvation. Not somebody else's. Working out my own. Continuing the process that God began in me. So how do we work out our own salvation? I want to suggest you look again at verse 12. Working out our salvation means we work even when no one is looking. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Paul says, I want you to work out your salvation even when I'm not looking. I want you to work out your salvation in my absence in the same way as you did in my presence, whether somebody's looking or whether they are not, whether you are in a crowd or whether you stand by yourself, whether those who are around you are acknowledging their faith in Christ or whether you stand alone professing yours. Paul says, you were obedient in my presence. I'm praying you will continue that in my absence. Don't act different when nobody's looking. 
Someone once said, character is who you are when no one's looking. But Paul reminds us God sees. Work out your salvation, even if I'm not there. God is the x-ray of our spiritual condition. Keep working out your salvation, even if no one is looking. Work out your salvation. Note, secondly, working out our salvation means we work even when we don't set the agenda. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his pleasure. Note that last part. Not necessarily mine, but his. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. So, Paul says, stop grumbling and complaining. Work out your own salvation even when you don't set the agenda. Even when things might not work out the way you think, work out your own salvation. Do all things without grumbling or arguments. Now, Jay and I have a practice that we've done throughout most of our married life where we have scripture verses around various places in our house. And there is Philippians 2.14 written in our laundry room on a little plaque, not the whole verse, just the particular part of that translation, do all things without grumbling or complaining. (laughs) Now, that's not exactly what that says on our board. I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know if it was someone who accidentally or someone who mischievously did this. Someone made the L in complaining into a T by crossing the line at the top. So actually what it says in the board on our laundry room is do all things without grumbling or complaining. (laughs) Been that way now all of these years in our house for 15 or 20 years or so, strangely appropriate. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Have you noticed that there's a lot of grumbling and complaining that goes on? Work out your salvation, even if you don't set the agenda. It's God who's at work in you to will and to do, watch this, for his pleasure. Our goal is not our pleasure. Our goal is his. We work out our salvation in a way that brings honor and glory and pleasure to him. Read further, we work out our own salvation means we work even when darkness threatens to hide your light. Do all things without grumbling or complaining so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Two images. A crooked and perverse generation and a generation of darkness. Paul recognizing the reality that you and I still perceive that the generation in which we live is crooked and perverse. And darkness hovering over this generation. And Paul says, you live different. In the midst of a generation that is crooked and perverse, you live straight and holy. In the midst of a generation in darkness, you shine as light. And Paul says you work out your salvation, even if working out your salvation means you shine as light in a very dark place. Paul reminds us the world needs to see believers who shine Be straight in the midst of the crooked. Be light in the midst of the darkness. God, recognizing the darkness and the despair of the world around us, does not throw up his hands in despair, wondering, what will I do? Rather, he places his people in strategic places to be a light in a dark place. And Paul says, you work out your salvation as a light in a dark world. And how the world needs to see the light of Christ in us. Your obedience is light in the darkness. Your obedience is straight in the midst of the crooked. You work out your own salvation 
even when the darkness threatens to hide your light. But then I note one final thing in this passage. You work out your salvation even when the work costs. Prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world holding firmly the word of life so that on the day of Christ I may take pride because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul's using an image, a metaphor, a picture of a sacrifice. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, when a burnt offering would be offered, the Bible describes the pouring of the oil over the sacrifice, and it was that oil that ascended into the nostrils of the Father as a soothing aroma. And Paul says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, even if my life is being poured out as a sacrifice for Christ, even if my life is being sacrificed... The last book that Paul wrote was 2 Timothy. The last chapter of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, probably the last words that Paul ever wrote, in which Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, I am being poured out as a drink offering. Here in Philippians 2, Paul says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and then the recognition later, Paul says, I am being poured out as a drink offering. And Paul says, you work out your salvation even if working it out costs. Even if my serving the Lord costs something, even if it means my sacrifice, even if it means, Paul says, my life is being poured out as a drink offering, a sacrifice for Christ, work out your salvation. I keep serving faithfully. I keep serving obediently. And Paul says, that is why I rejoice. And then finally, verse 18, you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul says, that's what I want for you. Even if it means you being poured out as a drink offering, even if it means the difficulty, the cost of a sacrifice work out your own salvation it is God who is at work in you keep working out your salvation years ago when I was a seminary student I was interviewing with a church for a particular position that they had and and I had a lunch meeting a private meeting with the pastor prominent church who uh, the pastor's name he's retired but probably a name that you would know and I was interviewing him with him as a young seminary student eager to be involved in the work of the church and we met over lunch and we were on our way back to the church after lunch and it was just the two of us in the car Uh, must not have been July because I had my window rolled down he must have been driving slowly I know that because the car behind us pointed that out. (laughs) First by honking, and then verbally, pointing out in a not-so-kind way to the pastor, you're holding me up. And as we got to the intersection, the verbal abuse became more abusive words that I would not share in any public gathering, despite what my friend said last Sunday. (laughs) And we got parallel at the stoplight, and the profanity and the verbal abuse came to a crescendo, and finally the man in desperation turned and sped off in the other direction, and there's that moment of awkward silence, me sitting in the front seat with the pastor and kind of shaking my head and grimacing and chuckling just a little. And he responded, you think that's funny? That guy was a member of my church. (laughs) He's still working it out. (laughs) Maybe you are too. Work out your own salvation. 
And I remind you today, maybe today, your faith needs exercise. Maybe your faith needs working out. Work out what God has worked in. Paul reminds us we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. It's not unsolvable. It just needs working out. Work out your own salvation.